Hello, my name's Kate Astbury. I'm Professor of French Studies at the University of Warwick. And since 2013, I've been working with Portchester Castle, which is one of English Heritage's sites, to explore the French prison of war theatre that was housed in the keep in um, 1810 to 1814. This evening's event is part of the Being Human Festival 2020. I'm just going to give you a short introduction to the festival before I go on to introduce those we're going to be talking to this afternoon, this evening. This event is part of the National Being Human Festival of the Humanities, taking place across the UK between the 12th and the 22nd of November. Being Human is the only national festival of the humanities run by the School of Advanced Study, University of London, in partnership with the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the British Academy. Events are mostly online this year, and you can see the full programme at www.beinghumanfestival.org. Festival can be found at, at beinghumanfest on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook, and the hashtag is hashtag beinghuman2020. Please help us to keep as many festival events as possible free and to improve the festival in future years by taking a moment to fill in a feedback survey. We're going to be giving you details of that later. And finally, if you'd like to help support the festival by making a donation, then we will put that chat in uh, the link in the chat for you to go and find beinghumanfestival.org slash support hyphen us. Thank you very much. So some introductions to the discussion panel this evening. I'm going to get them to, to be called up onto, onto screen so that you can actually see them as I make the introductions. I'm going to run through the introductions in the order in which I've begun working with people. It seemed to me that that made the, the, the most sense. So I'm going to introduce you, first of all, to Abigail Coppins, who is uh, currently a PhD student at Warwick, researching the women and children who were among the 2,500 prisoner of war brought from St. Lucia and St. Vincent in 1796 and housed at Porchester Castle. She co-curated English Heritage's permanent exhibition on the prisoners of war brought from the Caribbean, which opened in the keep in July 2017. And without her research, stretching back over a decade now, none of this would be possible. Abigail and I started working with Elaine Michener, who's the next person I'd like to introduce, in 2018. Elaine is an internationally renowned experimental vocalist, movement artist and composer whose work encompasses improvisation, contemporary music, theatre and performance art. Her music theatre piece, Sweet Tooth, has been described as a vital black British addition to those seminal creative statements of resistance and defiance from the African diaspora. Her sound installation, Les Murs Sont Témoins, These Walls Bear Witness, was at Portchester Castle from July to November 2019. At the moment, Elaine, Abby and I are working with the National Youth Theatre and English Heritage's Shout Out Loud project, thanks to National Lottery Heritage Funds, which allow the Shout Out Loud project to work alongside the National Youth Theatre. Now, the Shout Out Loud project is a national youth engagement programme to help young people uncover untold stories from our past. And the prisoners at Portchester is definitely a great example of an untold story that we still haven't really begun to, to tell properly. So I'm going to introduce you now to the, the two of the key players in the project from the National Youth Theatre. Firstly, Mumba Dodwell, who is a freelance task force representative and who in 2019 was the NYT uh, Brian Forbes Bursary, the NIT Rep, Brian Forbes Bursary. She's a founding member of the Diversity School Initiative, which is an organisation established to address underrepresentation and diversity in UK drama schools. Since, and I quote the Diversity School Initiative's website, everyone should be given a fair and equal opportunity to train, to learn, to experiment, and to fulfil their potential regardless of their gender, ability, ethnicity, social status, nationality, faith, sexuality, or sexual orientation. And not least, Lakeisha Aria Angelo, Associate Director at Soho Theatre, who previously directed NYT's 2019 production of Summerfest at the Bunker Theatre. Luckily for us, she said in a post on um, the London South Bank Uni site where she was a student, that she loves working on shows where she knows little to nothing about the subject matter and she has to do extra research. So someone somewhere at NYT had looked at this um, by bio on the website and thought Lakeisha is the person for us because we really are going into uncharted water in this current project to use a play written by prisoners of war, French prisoners of war in the early 19th century 
to think about and move beyond traditional narratives of the enslaved as victims to celebrating black agency. And the new play is going to touch on issues, therefore, as, as much relevance today as then. So to give you a, a bit of context to what we're going to talk about. The context, I suppose, is the permanent exhibition at uh, English Heritage's Portchester Castle site. And the permanent exhibition explores two different groups of prisoners of war. We've got a group of two, two and a half thousand prisoners of war brought from the Caribbean in 1796. These were men, women and children who'd been involved in the revolutionary struggle in the Caribbean. We've also got a second group of French prisoners of war who arrive at the castle in 1810, who were conscripts in Napoleon's army and had been captured in Spain. They uh, create a theatre at Portchester and are always on the lookout for plays about, the, you know, new plays that they can use for inspiration. On the prison hold in Portsmouth Bay, prisoners of war put on a play about fictional revolutionaries of African descent who bear a number of similarities to the real revolutionaries from St. Lucia, St. Vincent and other islands who were held at English Heritage, uh, the English Heritage property of Portchester 10 years earlier. And it's those two groups of prisoners linked by this play, the revolutionary philanthropist, that has brought the five of us together in this creative project. In 2019, this play was the starting point for Elaine Michener to create a temporary sound installation. And now in 2020, we're beginning a new project with National Youth Theatre to develop a play inspired by some of the stories at Portchester. To set the scene, under normal circumstances, we might actually have done this at the castle in Portchester rather than virtually. Um, so I was wondering, Mumba and Lakeisha, you've very recently visited Portchester for the first time. I was wondering if the two of you could give us a sense of your impressions of the castle and the exhibition there so that those who've not been to Portchester can, can get a sense of the, of the space that we're talking about. Um, yeah, so um, I, uh, I think I can kick off. Um, so uh, Lakeisha and I went to the castle at a time where we'd just been let out for lockdown. So it's quite a nice day out to be by the seaside, to be so near the coast. And um, and the castle is quite, the space is quite expansive. And we met with Abigail there. And I think that what was really interesting about it is that it's a space that was ever changing. And I think that's something we don't really think about historical um, buildings. We think that they were built that way and that's how they stay or they had renovations. But it was really nice to see sort of the graffiti on the wall and of the prisoners and to see where roofs were, uh, where roofs used to be and where they've been taken down and um the castle is quite big it was massive the keep it was quite big and i think it was really exciting for us to start imagining where these voices and people would have been in the space as a theatrical production so it was a really good experience to see it and the walls are thick i don't know how that how that adds to it but there's something about the denseness of the castle itself as a prisoner that must have had an impact on the people mm. there like it feels really solid as a as a building, doesn't it? Really feels really solid with mm. thick walls. Even though you know there's like you can hear the kind of wind blowing through, and you can hear sound traveling around the building, but it feels like a solid bit of structure um, and beautiful grounds outside as well. It just feels like a a space of lots of opportunity creatively, mm. um, and because it's it's one of those sites that isn't full of um, loads of artifacts and things or, or decorated. You know, it's it's left. Um, as as it has been over the last you know few centuries, it feels like it's, it, there's lots of opportunities for us to kind of play around with it. Um, and I was thinking about this the other day. There's, I think, I think it's probably the first time I've been round to a kind of um, a heritage site and being taken on a tour by, with Abigail and with Dominique, and having talked about a space that felt like it's part of my history as well in this country. Um, I don't think I've ever had that experience in this country, which is quite sad, but actually just going around and going, this is a space where there are people, there are people that look like me, you know, in this, in this, in this building, um, which is a really enriching experience and really um, profound. And it you kind of did sense that there's lots of stories and loads of, you know, um, people and issues and things that would have happened and, and occurred in, in that building. So it was, it was a really um, great privilege to just experience and feel that in the space on, on such a beautiful hot day as well, which, yes. which is what we're all grateful for. 
Yeah, the prisoners from the Caribbean arrived in November. We can't, I can't begin to imagine the shock of arriving in a damp castle in November, straight from St. Lucia. Um, it doesn't bear thinking about. Um, I'm going to hand over to, to Abigail now, who's going to just set the scene for, for the project by telling a little bit of the story of the prisoners from the Caribbean. So we've got a PowerPoint um, presentation of some images to, to go alongside. Um, we've got Naomi in the background doing all the practical bits. Thank you very much. So Abigail, all you need to do is say, can we change slides and, and it will magically happen for you, which is, which is a real luxury. Can you tell us then a little bit about why they were prisoners of war, why they were from the Caribbean at Port Chester, how they got there, what was life like for them? Okay. Yes, um, so it's the year is 1793 and Britain and France have gone to war yet again. And in response to that, um, Britain sets up a network of war prisons, basically, um, to hold enemy soldiers and sailors, what we would now call prisoners of war. And, Port and the castle at Porchester is one of these war prisons. And almost as soon as the war starts, prisoners start arriving at Porchester from all over the globe. Could I have the second slide, please? So in 1796, large numbers, about two and a half thousand um, French soldiers, arrive at Porchester. And they've been captured in fighting between Britain and France in the Southern Caribbean particularly on the islands of St Lucia, St Vincent and Grenada. And the prisoners are mainly free black and mixed race French soldiers, including officers, um, women and children as well. Many would have been formerly enslaved, but had been freed by France in 1794 when France abolished slavery on their Caribbean islands. Britain is still a slave-owning nation, so France's abolition of slavery changes everything in that part of the Caribbean. And large numbers of newly free men go into the French armed forces and help France in their war with Britain. So this is a war not just about compete, um, a, a war between competing sort of colonial powers in the Caribbean. It's also an ideological war in which um, newly freed peoples take on the fight for freedom and self-determination across the Caribbean. In this fight, those, those men, women and children of, of colour take centre stage. Um, next slide, please. So the journey, take um, once they're captured in St Lucia, the journey back to, to the Prison, journey to the prison at Porchester is really, really um, dangerous. Um, it's a, um, they managed to leave the Caribbean just before the hurricane season starts, so in, um, at about the end of July. Um, but they hit storms a day or so out from the island of Tortola. Um, and they also encountered thick fog as well. And the red, the red line on this map shows the approximate route of, of, the, um, of the, the, the prisoners. But many ships only just make it across the Atlantic. And one ship, which is depicted by the green line on this map, um, loses almost all its crew to sickness. And an army lieutenant with barely any sailing experience is put in charge. And he heads for what he thinks is Porchester. But actually, everyone ends up um, in the Mersey, close to Liverpool. Um, then they turn around and end up near the Scilly Isles, and then they end up in um, Ireland. So they do a slightly circuitous um, trip to Porchester via um, the Mersey and Ireland. Uh, other ships um, that are bringing the prisoners of war back are actually crewed by the prisoners themselves because so many of the ship's crew died on the voyage. Um, but eventually all the ships arrive at Portsmouth, all the prisoners are removed and placed into the, into the prison at Porchester. Sick prisoners are sent on to another smaller prison close to Porchester called Fulton because it had a, um, a bigger hospital and more doctors. So final slide, if I could have that. So I thought I'd talk, uh, sorry, um, slide four, please. 
Yeah, that's it. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, so finally, I'll just go quickly through what life would have been like for the prisoners once they were inside the castle. Um, you can see the day I put the daily routine up here on, on the slide and you can see that they get up at six in six in the morning in the summer. There's a bell. They, they are allowed out into an airing ground fed. Then there's a market um, and then they have lunch. And then at sunset, they all get locked up into their dormitories. So they're allowed to move around the castle uh, and have it and interact with outsiders as well in the prison market. But for the Caribbean soldiers, they start to have problems almost immediately that they arrive at Porchester. Um, they start to be bullied by the European soldiers. They have their clothing stolen. And in the end, the prison staff have to get them housed in separate accommodation from the other prisoners in order to protect them. They, they had very little clothing when they arrived in November in Britain from the Caribbean. You can imagine how cold they must have been. And they were finding the British climate really difficult to cope with. So the, so the prison gave them extra clothing, such as woolen waistcoats, extra, extra blankets for the bed, thicker socks. And um, the prison staff also tried to bulk them up a bit by feeding them extra potatoes. So that's that's my bit. That's great. Thank you very much, Abby. Um, it, it's this is all archival research that, that that Abigail has done in the archives to trace the special measures and the yeah you know, that they they tried to put in place to to help these prisoners through I mean, Port Chester. For anyone who's been, will know that Port Chester is cold in the middle of the summer because those thick walls that Lakeisha and Mumba have told us about the walls are so thick that inside the keep it is cold in the middle of summer, let alone the rest of the year. Um, we're going to play for you now something very special. One of the parts of Abigail's research was to, to find the registers of the prisoners at Port Chester. When they arrived, they were all the, 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 the British system for keeping records meant that they were recorded as arriving at Port Chester. And last year, as part of her sound installation, Elaine Michener used these registers to, to give the names back to the castle, if you like. So we're just going to play you an extract. It starts very quietly. Don't, don't panic. It does start very quietly because you're meant to stop and listen. This is not background noise, but Elaine's very deliberately set up the sound installation to make you stop and listen and think about what you're hearing. So we're going to play you an extract from her sound installation, which is taken from the names of some of the prisoners in the registers to give those voices back to the castle. So Naomi, if you could play us names, that would be great. Gabriel. Soldier, Fournier, Soldier, Thomas Laroche, Soldier, Jean-François, Soldier, Dieu Donné, Soldier, Jean Carrère, Soldier, Carny, Soldier, Papé, Soldier, Sazar, Jean Meunier, Soldier, Soldier, Edouard, Jean Marie, Soldier, Soldier, Louis, Opéra. Soldier, Soldier, Augustin Camus, Joseph Soldier, Postillon. Bernardin, Soldier, François Le Versier, Maigrinier, Soldier. Soldier. I'm going to ask Elaine to come in now. We'll hear again from Abby in a moment, but I, I think that I'd like to bring Elaine in at this point. Hi, Could you hello. Talk to us a little bit. I, the, the names get me every time, even when I'm not in the castle listening to those names, just listening to them now. Can you talk to us a little bit about your, your personal, but also your artistic response to the fact that Abigail had managed to find the registers with the names of all of these prisoners from the Caribbean? Of course, um, it was so exciting because uh, in my previous project, Sweet Tooth, which I created um, and devised with three other musicians. It was a live uh, piece. Um, and we presented that at the Blue Coat in Liverpool um, in 2017. Part of that uh, piece was called Names. And for, for that uh, work, 
I memorized about 150 names from an inventory of 3,000 names of enslaved African people that was held on a plantation in Jamaica. And it, their names were given to them. So those weren't their birth names. And it, it, I decided to, to take on that task um, in order to really bring them back to life and for us to memorialize them and to remind us of their humanity as well, because they had been dehumanized. When I was then introduced to Abby, Abigail and was told about this register of names that she had discovered of uh, French uh, soldiers and their wives and their children who were held captive at Porchester Castle. I couldn't believe it because you know, this is Porchester Castle, which I'd never visited. I hadn't really heard of it until our introduction. And to think that these people had come from the Caribbean uh, where, which is my heritage, and I had I just had had a clue about it, and I just thought, well, they were freedom fighters fighting for their freedom uh, to overthrow uh, slavery. They were revolutionaries because they considered themselves to be free men and women um, under the French Constitution at the time, and it just felt like the right thing to do in order to remind ourselves who they were, that their names and what their rank was. And for names, I asked two uh, French Caribbean people who aren't actors, they're not actors, um, to read these names out. It took about three hours each. There are a lot of names, 2000 names, but it was important for me to have a, a female voice as well as a male voice to also remind the visitors to the castle that women were held there. Women were fighting for their freedom and incarcerated in the castle. There's a lot of, uh, of responsibility when you're dealing with historical artifacts and, and resources. There are ethics involved in how you use them. So it was very important to me to be able to, to present these names in the way that was positive, that showed them not as victims, but it's very, very strong personalities. Um, and it also provided another kind of narrative uh, about the experience of black people um, in that period who struggled and fought valiantly for their freedom. And it's not a story that we hear enough of, although this project and what we're doing with NYT is going a, a huge way to changing that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, I think that at, at this point, I think it would be useful just to talk, we, we are, we're, we're leading up to how we're getting to the NYT. We did, we, we, it would be too quick to get there straight away. I'm gonna hold you in suspense a bit longer. Look, Mumba and Lakeisha are coming. I'm just gonna hold the audience that tiny bit longer. Because I want to talk about the practicalities of doing a sound installation in a Norman keep. Now, Abby's gonna tell us a little bit about how we got the ball rolling. And then Elaine can perhaps come back in and, and talk about a little bit more about the, the, the artistic vision and the practicalities from your side of doing a sound installation in a keep that really only has one plug. I mean, that's a slight exaggeration, <laughs> but not by much. Um, Abby, do you want to come in and talk to us about uh, how you got the ball rolling on the sound installation? And Naomi, we've got a few slides to go with that. Yeah, just the one, just the one slide. Um, well, it was um, it was just after I, I finished working on the the permanent exhibition, which is on prisoners of war, including the black prisoners of war, um, it, at Porchester, which was in uh, sort of July 2017, I think. So I just finished working on that project for English Heritage, and I was kind of sat at my desk wondering where I was going to go next, and Kate had been working with us as well on the recreation of the Prisoner of War Theatre that we've done there, which you can see, um, which is the bottom um, picture. And what was really weird was that almost as soon as I started thinking about this, I got this email from Elaine about um, talk, telling me about her Sweet Tooth production. And Elaine was looking for a space to, to perform Sweet Tooth and thought that the space at Porchester might suit. 
And so I sort of looked at the email and thought, fantastic, this is where I'm going next. And so I organised a meeting for Elaine and myself at Porchester and I asked Kate along. <laughs> and luckily, Kate was already booked to do an event down there the same day that Elaine was coming down. So it was kind of almost as if the stars were aligned to get us all to work together. Um, in the end, um, what happened was that we thought we could do a performance and sound piece specifically tailored to Porchester rather than um, doing the, redoing a, the production of Sweet Tooth. So basically, that, that's how it kind of got started. It was just serendipity. <laughs> And um, we should uh, thank English Heritage for having the, the confidence in, um, in what we wanted to do. When I started working with them in 2013, and they didn't know me from Adam and I rocked up and said, I want to put on a play in your castle. And they let me. Um, yeah, so we did have a track record before we went and said, we want to do a sound installation and it's going to be completely crazy because we're going to have to try and find a way of rigging up sound and speakers. Um, but they trusted us and, and with the, the help of, of Sam Stone's uh, building uh, manager to make sure we didn't do any damage to the property. Um, some of the practicalities are, are very complicated. The size of the scaffolding to rig some of the sound installation up was, was nerve wracking and I was on the ground looking at it. Um, Elaine, do you want to just come and, and tell us a little bit more about the sound installation? Obviously, sadly, it was a temporary installation. So I can't, we can't send everyone to Portchester to, to, to listen to it at the moment. But could you tell us a little bit about how you made some of the artistic choices for the installation? Of course, yes. Um, I, having looked at the resources that you and Abby had kindly shared with me, um, I had to spend a lot of time thinking and reflecting on, on what to do with this material because that, when you walk into a, a space like Porchester, of course, you can just walk around and say, oh, that's a thick wall, oh, that's where, and it's an amazing space as it is. And there's also, Abby ha uh, had overseen um, an installation that's at the top, which explains about the prison, the black French prisoners of war. And so that's, that's a permanent exhibition, I should say. And Kate, yourself, you have the theatre at, on the ground level. So it's not as though there isn't anything in the castle whatsoever. There, there are lots of points of interest and architecturally, it's really fascinating. Um, but I, I'm really interested in animating, reanimating spaces. And it's it was an idea of mine. I hadn't done a sound installation on that scale before. So this was a first for, a, for lots of reasons. Um, and I had no idea how difficult it was going to be, but I was determined that we would do it because what it, what I wanted for uh, the uh, visitors to experience is for them to be drawn into different parts of the keep and then to really think about what it might have felt like there to have been taken from the Caribbean and to arrive in November, cold, miserable, terrible journey, difficult journey, not knowing what your future will be and how you would survive that. Um, because there is another story that that happens afterwards. So I really was, I was interested in the, the secret spaces and using sound to draw people in and then working with the play that was written 10 years um, after the uh, black POWs were at Castle to kind of use a quote from that play and subvert it because that's the way I work, um, but to repurpose the meaning of it so that we think about what it means to be free as well and what those people were fighting for. So I had to make some choices and, and with the extracts that I used, I used non-archival non archival material, I should say, such as chicadas, insects, uh, tropical uh, rainforest soundscapes, as a reminder for trying to think about if you were from a hot country, what would keep you going, the memories of home, how it felt to try and kind of recreate your own inner warmth. There are fire sounds, um, and there was also a sound of guaca drumming, and guaca is a, a traditional drumming star that originated in 17th century Guadeloupe, and it's part of the big drum tradition that 
uh, shared across the whole of the Caribbean. And it, uh, it was brought from West Africa and it's very much alive now. And it's also, it's quite unnerving to hear um, if you're not used to hearing it. And it's also used to, uh, to share messages and you have to understand that drum rhythm to know what's being said. So there is also playing with these ideas of, of perhaps the prisoners kept that alive as well. And it's something that was very different to what English the English uh, governor would have would have been used to hearing, or the English soldiers would have been used to hearing. So it really was to try and reanimate that space and to make the walls speak, um, because the walls bore witness to the events, and they can speak of those events. So I'm I, I'm hoping that it was successful. I believe it. I believe uh, we kind of pulled it off. But from a practical point of view, it was fiendishly difficult. It was scary. The scaffolding was scary. I brought on board Harry Bishop, who's an amazing sound engineer, and he brought his team of workers. And there were so many practical, difficult things. I can't remember the thickness of the walls. Yes, there's probably only one plug, which, you know, it was just terrible. One socket, one plug, you know, it was, but we managed it. And I'm grateful to um, English Heritage for allowing us to tramp around for a week to, to make this installation work. Elaine, we do actually have the drum extract. Shall we ah, play some drums? Yes, please. Let's play some drums. Could you find the drum extract for us, Naomi, as a treat for Elaine? For... I'm going to come back to our, to Elaine again in a moment. I'm going to try and 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 sort of bring the dots together of of some of this picture because the sound installation, as Elaine has explained to you, used a play by the Prisoners of War. So I wanted to just give you a bit of context to the theatre. Um, if I could have the PowerPoint slide up, Naomi, that would be great. I wanted to show you um, a little or talk to you a little bit about the theatre how the prisoners came to build a theatre, what it would have looked like, and how that then ties in with the, the, the prisoners from the Caribbean. So if we have the next slide, um, I have put um, a, a photograph of the reconstruction of the prisoners' theatre. It's an impression of what the theatre might have looked like. Um, health and safety mean that we can't quite reconstruct the entire theatre as it would have looked at the time. They would have had a stage high enough to put a trap door so that you could have had people come up from under the stage. They had full fly system. Um, it was a fully working theatre in miniature because one of the prisoners who was imprisoned there in 1810 was a professional machinist from the Paris prisons. And so he was able to actually construct a theatre that was a full working um, system. I have to, at this point, say thank you to, to Devon Cox, who was one of my former PhD students who introduced me to the material at Port Chester. He came to me, um, I had funding from the AHRC to do a project on French theatre of the Napoleonic era. And Devon came to see me and said, I've been told that there's a box of material at the V&A. They've just acquired a box of material about French theatre at Port Chester. Are you interested? Um, I said, well, I don't know there's quite enough there to make a whole PhD, Devon, which has to be the worst um, line by a PhD supervisor ever, because of course there was more than enough for Devon to write a PhD on the theatre at, at Port Chester. Um, but the story doesn't quite start with, with, with Port Chester, tempting, tempting though it is. Um, the, start, the story actually starts on the prison hulks. And I think I might have put my slides in the wrong order, but we'll have the next slide, which is what, the, what tonight should have looked like is the next slide. That's, um, go back a second, I'll do this one. Um, that's the theatre full. 
That is the launch of the permanent exhibition in July 2017 when we put on one of the Prisoner of War plays. And that's what you should be doing this evening rather than being at home in your, in your houses. Um, that's what it would have been like to be crammed into Portchester for a, for a live event. However, being online does mean that we're able to have um, people in St Lucia listening into this story. So, so there is an upside to us being online rather than in the castle. Um, but the story about the theatre really does begin on the prison hulks, which is my next slide. In 1807, a public performance on the crown of a play about the Haitian Revolution took place. We know this because the playbill has survived. We have the playbill that says that they were putting on this public performance of a play entitled The Revolutionary Philanthropist, a play about the Haitian Revolution, on board one of these prison hulks, which were decommissioned Navy ships. Uh, this is a, um, a, a drawing taken from a painting by one of the, the most famous artists amongst the prisoners of war called Louis Guerret. It was painted dozens and dozens and dozens of pictures of the prison hulks in Portsmouth Harbour. So this play about the Haitian Revolution, the revolutionary philanthropist, was written by a prisoner of war, we don't know who it was, a Frenchman sent by Napoleon to, in inverted commas, reclaim Haiti. The French sent the, the campaign sent by Napoleon to try and get Haiti back. Uh, in inverted commas, was an utter disaster. And the, 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 the sailors end up as prisoners of Britain. That's how they end up on the prison hulks back uh, in the bay uh, beneath Portchester Castle. And while there, they write and perform a historical drama told from the white colonial perspective, but giving the black revolutionaries a very powerful voice within that. Now, we might ask what naval captain thought that allowing prisoners of war to put on a play about those fighting for their freedom was, was a good idea on board a prison hulk. Um, it's quite an incendiary topic to have prisoners performing a play about those who are fighting for freedom. But the play went ahead. And not only that, the play text, the manuscript, was, was kept because it was copied in January 1811. Now, that date uh, will mean nothing to most of you, obviously. Um, it's the time at which the Portchester Theatre was at its height. The Portchester Theatre had been built in 1810 and they'd started performing plays in the autumn of 1810 and had been receiving uh, rave reviews. There is a review in the Hampshire Telegraph saying that the prisoners have put on um, plays that couldn't, that, that rival those of London. So the theatre is at its height. They are looking for new material. If they're not writing their own plays, they are having plays sent from Paris that they can adapt and put on. So I think that the fact that this play, The Revolutionary Philanthropist, is copied in January 1811 is almost certainly because the prisoners at Portchester were on the lookout for new material that they could put on. They're performing plays twice a week. Devon Cox in his thesis has shown us the list of plays for the first few months. Sadly, the transport board, who were responsible for the oversight of all prisoners of war in Britain at the time, get wind of the theatricals and put an end to public performances. From January 1811, the plays are in private and the, the person in charge of the garrison, a man called uh, Patterson, is sent on to another commission on a ship. He takes with him all the information about the prisoner's play. But after that point, we don't have a record of what they were performing. So we don't actually have a record to say the revolutionary philanthropist was performed at Portchester. But January 1811, it seems to me there's only one reason why that play is copied when it is. Not only is it copied, but also illustrated. And this is my next slide. Um, this painting is, or watercolour sketch, is courtesy of uh, the University of, of Berkeley, where the manuscript is held. So each act of the historical drama, when it's copied in January 1811, has an illustration to go with it. This is from the first act. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a young white man has been captured by the, the, the revolutionaries and he is being... Um, He's there being speaking to the, the main 
the, the leader of the the, the, the revolutionaries, um, a man called Spartacus, who is there in the tricorn hat on the, the left hand side. Spartacus has been inspired by the Declaration of the Rights of Man amongst, amongst other revolutionary texts and is spurred on by the eponymous revolutionary philanthropist of the title of the play, who is very loosely based, or not very loosely, quite closely based on the figure of Sontonax, who was the commissioner sent by the revolutionaries in Paris to take control of the island in, in 1793. Uh, Toussaint Louverture, you saw an image of him in, in, in Abigail's slides earlier. Toussaint Louverture is also in the play, or mentioned in the play. He doesn't actually appear, but he's mentioned under um, the name of, of, of Nisou. So they reverse his name so that he does appear as well. So there are some real characters. And interestingly, the names of the plantation owners are the names of actual plantation owners on the island. So we know that there's a certain amount of local colour being brought in from those who were on Haiti, sent by Napoleon to try and um, and, 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 and get the, the, the island back for Napoleon. What we have in this play is a fictional representation of the sort of struggle that the Caribbean prisoners you've already heard about had been engaged in on St Lucia, on St Vincent, before they were captured and brought to Port Chester. So, so the sound installation with, with, with Elaine, it was a first attempt at bringing these two stories together. And I apologize for the chronology being complicated because you've got two batches of prisoners, one a predominantly Parisian batch who are the, the, the theater uh, practitioners in 1810, and then the much larger group of, of Caribbean prisoners the decade earlier. We're going to play um, an extract from the revolutionary philanthropist. I can get my teeth back in. Revolutionary philanthropist. Um, it's it is the the eponymous um, uh, philanthropist, the Sontonax figure, emancipating uh, the 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 enslaved of African descent. Several months before then, uh, the revolutionary government in Paris will will confirm that for all the French um, territories. So if we could have uh, the speech extract, Naomi, that would be great. My principles are unwavering. The French people, through the organ of its representatives, has invested me with my authority, and I am answerable to them alone. France has decreed the rights of man, and she has abolished feudalism. The intention of all her representatives is to make all men on French territory enlightened and free. May all oppressors perish. May the persecutors of the blacks of Saint-Domingue perish. France has called on the friends of liberty. These sacred words alone are the ones she wants as the foundation stone of her laws. Liberty, equality. I no longer recognize distinctions of color. And I declare to you that prejudice will no longer despoil this land. We're playing the extract in an English translation. It would have been performed in French originally. We do have the recordings in French as well. Elaine got her, her, um, her, her, her not actors, her friends to actually do who did the recordings. They are recorded in, in, in both languages so that they, they're useful in different contexts. Um, but for the purposes of, of this evening, we're, we're offering it you in, in translation so that anyone without French can still see some of the power behind um, the words. Elaine, can I bring you back in at this point? Um, you talked earlier about how you subvert. So this is a play where ultimately the revolution fails and the plantation owners win through. Um, but could you tell us a little bit about how you repurposed the play and, and, and subverted it? Uh, well, having read the play, um, which uh, starts off uh, with uh, the protagonist, uh, Spartacus, uh, declaring his freedom based on, on the con French constitution, it all starts really brilliantly and, uh, and he leads the revolt, but it ends in a very ridiculous way. Um, which I'll, I'll, I'll hold the ending back uh, for those who, who do want to read the play. Um, but it was clear to, to me, and having discussed it with you, um, that it was a propaganda piece. It was a warning uh, to the listeners, to those who were 
uh, experiencing the play in the prison that they couldn't allow any more revolts um, or insurrections across the Caribbean because that would end the uh, that would end slavery and that would not be in the best interests of Western European uh, countries that were profiting from it um, and it was. I, I just felt actually I could take that text, I could take those lines and use them um, in a way that actually points to the to, to freedom, really, and that that is a human right. It's not something to be afraid of. And so that speech by the revolutionary philanthropist who who gave kind of gave freedom, um, but actually uh, was a very strange character in the play anyway for me, but was basically declaring this freedom and saying, look, you have a right to be free. And if anyone who tries to prevent you from doing that, you have a right to physically uh, prevent them from stopping you from being free. So that could mean taking a life. You know, that's actually, I wasn't expecting to read that in the play, but that was also in there to instill fear into those who were listening, so, you know, if if we don't if we don't batten down on this, and if we don't if we don't keep uh, slavery going and keep these people under our thumb, then they will they will kill us. Um, and of course, revolts happened across the, the Caribbean, and this is based it's 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 set in Saint Domingue, where there was a a very successful re revolt that sent. Uh, shockwaves across the Caribbean, but also we know about the Haitian Revolution, and that was that is the most famous one for you know those who don't know about that period of history. So in terms of subverting it, I really wanted to give the words back to those who were fighting for their freedom and let them say this text because it does feel very different. And it was really interesting when we were recording it uh, with working with my friends who are, they were from the French Caribbean and also from France and they were surprised. They didn't know about the play like myself, but also there was a lot about the history that they didn't know themselves because they hadn't been taught that. So there's this erasure on so many levels. And there was a, this other kind of energy in the room when we were recording it because it's like, oh my God, I didn't know this happened. And this is how I feel about it. So it was, I didn't have to tell them or direct them into how to, to read the text their response, their natural responses to it, gave the right energy in terms of proclaiming that text. And that was really important, I think. I, for me, it was very important to have the ordinary, an ordinary person get, uh, actually reading that text, because actually they were extraordinary people who were able to revolt against this system. Great, thank you, um, Elaine. I wondered whether I could at this point just, just bring uh, Abigail back in briefly because one of the other ways in which Elaine subverted the the sound installation was to talk or to bring the, the women into it more. Um, and I wondered whether very briefly you could just tell us a tiny bit. So this is, this is the topic of Abigail's yeah. PhD. So she's not going to give you very much. You're all going to have to no. wait for her to write it. <laughs> but she's going to give you... Bit enough of a teaser just to be just so that you, you you're aware of the the fact that there were women and children who came with yeah. the, the what we're going to label the you know the freedom fighters of St Lucia and St Vincent who chose to come rather than be left behind can you just give us a little bit of a taste of of what we know about the women and children who came to yeah so could I have um the, my next slide please that's got a picture of the women and children on it. Um, there we go. It's always easier with a, a with an image. So early on in the research, when I was still finding the, the, the black prisoners at Porchester and still finding their names in the registers, I came across references to the fact that there were women and children also um, arriving at Porchester in amongst the black and mixed race prisoners poor. Um, and the women are just as diverse as the men. They're a whole mix of black women, mixed race, white European women as well, uh, and their children. And they're sent on to another prison at Forton, um, where they're all housed together in an empty hospital building. They're 
they're allowed to have their husbands and family members go live with them, which I was very surprised at. Some of them are giving birth whilst in, in the prison hospital, but um, and they had access to medical treatment. And I think it, it's very difficult to tease out um, women's lives out of the archives because there are so many silences, so many gaps. Um, women don't get written about very much. We're all um, they're often just sort of briefly mentioned in the background. Um, and what I've been trying to do is bring them out, find them, and then sort of give them give them a voice, just as Elaine's work is trying to give the prisoners a voice as well. Um, but um, rather that I, you know, this is my PhD, so I'm going to have to, we're all going to have to wait a bit until I sort of publish everything. Um, but I can say that these women are not passive. Um, they're a feisty bunch and they're quite capable of helping out with the fighting in the Caribbean. And they're certainly um, not backwards in coming forwards and demanding certain um, rights when they're in prison. And also, um, I will let I will just mention this snippet, which is that actually one in the Caribbean one of the ship's captains finds them trying to get on board his ship to free the, um, the prisoners, their menfolk. Um, and some of them managed to cut one of the mooring lines so that some of the prisoners can escape. So, you know, they're, they're, they're sassy but, and, and active. Great. Thank you, Abby. We also used in Elaine's sound installation a, a letter that we have from when they were they were released from, from Portchester and sent to France because they're French. The fact that they'd never set foot in France before that point is neither here nor there. But we do have a letter from, from them that, that Elaine used in the sound installation. We're just giving you that, that sort of introduction or a mention of the women and children at, at, at Port Jessica, because we're going to turn now to talking about this year's project. If, if 2019 was the sound installation, then 2020 and 2021 are very much about NYT, the National Youth Theatre. Um, the play, The Revolution of Philanthropist, is unperformable in a 21st century context because it's racist. It, it hinges on 18th and early 19th century notions of racial difference. Um, so we're setting out to to, to work creatively with that as the starting point for inspiration. So I'm going to bring in Mumba and Lakeisha, who are now going to explain how National, National Youth Theatre have become involved in this and, and, and where we go from here in terms of the, the, the telling of these untold stories at Portchester with the, this, this crazy play as a springboard to something that, that resonates in the modern world. Mumba, do you want to kick off? Um, yeah, I can definitely kick off. Um, so I am, um, as you mentioned, I'm a freelance director and the National Youth Theatre had approached me to um, work on this project. And for anyone who doesn't know, the National Youth Theatre is an organisation that works with young people up to the age of 26 um, in theatre. And they offer so many different projects and um, there's so many plays being developed. And I think that's what's really exciting about working with the National Youth Theatre is that they have the time and resource and also young people who really want to take part in this history. And um, that's what's really exciting for me was that there are young people who are at university or are doing other things and they're studying all sorts of different um, different things and also different journeys to where how they get into this space. So I was really keen to give back to them as well, to work with them because the history is for them, it's for us, it's for all of us. Um, so I was approaching, as you said, the play is unperformable. So um, they had talked about how do we take ownership of this production? Um, how do we uh, share this history through our own lens, I think, as well? And and I think that Lakeisha and I were approached because black women are usually missing from this history, don't have a say in this history. Um, and and so, yeah, so that was really important for me to be a part of this. And also, I am really I just really enjoy I'm picking Black British history. I think that so much of it is centered around just Windrush and um, slavery. I think people don't understand there is such a complex and big history and it's Black history is all our history because we're all linked. And I think this play really, like the Haitian Revolution or the history we have looked at really highlights that it's British history, but also French history as Elaine was really focusing on. It's French history, it's Caribbean history. Um, so what happened was earlier in the year, in July, um, Lakeisha and I um, had met with 
um, Kate and Elaine and Abigail to start delving in this history. So that was the first research and development period of this piece, um, which was just the, the sort of four of us every now and then, five of us, sorry, every now and then getting together on Zoom and trying to unpick this history, which Lakeisha and I, we were like, there is so much. <laughs> there is so still much. unpicking, still unpicking, still yeah. figuring it out, still trying to work that, out timelines. Yeah, I think that when it took us a while to click the two different groups of prisoners of war, we're like, sorry, who was where? Where was that? And um, so we spent some time researching that. And for the last, um, so sporadically, so in August, we spent um, five days with 12 actresses um, part, who are part of the National Youth Theatre, members, black women. Um, we spent uh, a week with them and we were unpacking this history and, and Lakeisha had written some bits, which she'll talk about in a moment, had written some bits that we explored together with the actors and we thought, what is the story here? What's our way in? What is going to fit in this castle? Um, like who who are the voices we need to hear from? And it's so nice to work with them because they are, they got so into it. We had met with historians who we'd never, I don't know, we just wouldn't have met with them. Like historians from all, like from, um, from out of the UK um, as well. And so we were learning this history together with the actors. And so we spent a week doing that. And then we also recently last week met together we were reading some of the script, just to fine tuning and trying to figure out our journey through this, um, so through this text, and um, and it's just so interesting to see how far it's come along and who these characters are. At first, I feel like I didn't know where the story was going. I didn't know what was going to happen, and now there are some really strong characters who are starting to come out and histories, which I think the young people are really taking ownership over. I think that's what they're so excited. Some of them, and it's just so great to see that. Um, them seeing, you know, this is my history. So yeah, yeah, that's great. Lakeisha, do you want to talk to us about? You're, you've got a really tricky task as playwright. Yeah, absolutely. you're responding to the archive. You're 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 being you're being faithful to 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 the ancestors and the stories that have come down to you. You're working in a a Black Lives Matter context, which we weren't expecting when we started this discussions between. English Heritage, Warwick and, and the National Youth Theatre. So there's a lot coming together all of a sudden and it's all resting on your shoulders. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah, how do you navigate that as a playwright and, and talk to us about the, 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 the exciting parts as well as the, the scary bits? Yeah, and thanks for reminding me just how daunting it is <laughs> because it really is. It really is. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Because <laughs> and it's it's nothing it's not a thing that I take lightly at all. Except for those exactly those reasons you just mentioned, and also the fact that you know you all you yourself and um, Abby and Dominique Bouchard and everyone have worked so hard to kind of collate this information and this work and this research. Um, I mean, kind of and have uncovered these wonderful stories of of individuals. Um, so for me, what's really exciting is is kind of reading between the lines of the things that have been suggested in the history books and the texts that have been provided, which, you know, a lot of it comes from, um, you know, a, a colonial lens um, and a white male lens as well. So what's been great is kind of just, uh, you know, kind of utilize some spring, utilizing the, the nuggets of information we have and springboarding off that and kind of going, who are the people that I'm really excited to explore? And it is those, the the women and the children that you know who were kind of mentioned but aren't really um spoken about that much it's the people that have you know that did have some kind of power within this as well so like people like Toussaint Louverture um Andre Rigal who you know were in the mix of the political stuff so, you know having conversations um with the powers in France and England and America and stuff like that and as well as people who we may not expect to see um, stories of so people so black people black and black mixed people who were owning plantations themselves as well so it's kind of just for me it was about um sh discovering and sharing the stories and the voices of individuals that we don't often see um in in this kind of you know artistic setting um and also and so on, and honoring those people and honoring their voices and their journeys and their stories and sharing just how nuanced and detailed and complex they were and how complex that world was at that time and you know the world is you know always complex but at that time as well and um and 
and you know, you're absolutely right. You know, in this context that we're living right now, in the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that we're li living through and experiencing right now, it does feel like there's a mirror, you know, to what we're experiencing right now, and it just it's it just kind of shows that there's you know the cycles of things and there's things that we need to um, learn and unlearn and relearn and um, and grow from and develop and, and heal from. So it's a really um, exciting opportunity to be able to um, share that with the, all the creators that are working on this project, the academics, with audiences, with anyone that is engaging in whatever shape or form, people that we're doing workshops with as well. I know Mumba's doing some great workshops with young people um, in, in West Midlands. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, a real, it's a real privilege. It's a real privilege, it's a real honor. Um, and it is daunting, but it's also really exciting as well because um, like, like you've all alluded to, we're all learning about our, our collective history it's our, everyone's history and it's something that we need to just um, understand so we kind of a bit have a great understanding of ourselves um, and not to repeat the same mistakes that we have made in the past. Um, so yeah, it's a great privilege. Mm. Oh, that's, that, that's great. I mean, one of the, one of the, the, the most inspiring things in some ways are about the, the, the prisoners from the Caribbean who were held at Port Chester um, whether they were from St. Lucia, whether they were from St. Vincent, whether they're from Granada, whether they were Garifuna. Um, um, and yeah, th all these people were coming together and, and they were inspired by the ideals of the revolution to, to seize freedom for themselves. And I think that's the part that, you know, I, I'm looking at you know, myself as a white woman growing up in the 1970s and 1980s in the school programme. What do we learn about, about abolition? Well, it's granted we the whites, <laughs> grand abolition. Um, and, and yet we've got these amazing um, prisoners at Port Chester that before they were prisoners, they were revolutionaries. They were out there, you know, they, they had the guillotine. I mean, allegedly one of the guillotines might actually still be in existence that, 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 um, that some of the revolutionaries use. Um, you know, they were actually trying to seize this for themselves. And I think that, that, that's the really inspiring part for me is that this is retelling a, a really important part of the of the movement in a way that we don't often hear because it's not it's not how I was taught yeah. abolition. I don't know how you were taught abolition. Um, you're not it's as old as I am. Maybe yeah. maybe school teaching is improved. No, it was <laughs> just maybe around it was like a paragraph on Wilberforce. And that's what I was gonna say about that thing about how what's really evident from this thing is that um from this thing it was from this history is there was an act of rebellion continuously and as we say like it wasn't just like one day they were like oh let's give them freedom it was like people had been fighting for years for this burning down plantations so dangerous that um French prisoners were not allowed, people escaping from Haiti were not allowed to go on other islands and granted pass because if people heard about what was going on in Haiti, the other Caribbean islands would revolt as well. It would inspire them. And so it's really just interesting how how empowering that is, how movements are really, really empowering and that erasure sort of stops that history from passing on. Mm. And even like, in, in, and at that stage revolting, but also revolting at every stage within slavery. Mm -hmm from you know in africa on the slave ships and this it's not often taught that some slave ships were taken over and you know returned back to africa and you know there were obviously revolutions in in the caribbean as well as in america we just don't get taught that we get taught about the act of slave enslaving africans in in the caribbean and, and predominantly in america actually i don't know if i was taught about slavery across the caribbean in school mm. I, I you very much get taught about in america um, and when you start to do any research about British stuff, you kind of you kind of start to learn it, you know, about what happened in Britain. But you don't really get a good um, education on 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 um, the Caribbean. Yeah, and considering, as we said, four, we found out that four percent of the enslaved went to America, while a large percent went to Brazil. I think it's around forty percent, and then the rest to the Caribbean islands. So these islands had so many people, far more. So it's really sad that we don't learn about them. You probably haven't got an eye on the on on the chat at the moment that that I have, and the, certainly some of some of those listening in from St Lucia are talking about how there's no trace of any. Of, these were the leading figures in the revolution in on St Lucia. Some of these, you know, Marinier, Marin Pedre, you know, the, were a whole co host of really big, important revolutionaries, and they ended up at Port Chester. But but back in St Lucia, their story has been forgotten. So this is about giving a story back, in some ways, not just to Port Chester Castle. This is about giving the story back, um, you know, giving that voice to, the, to, those, to those prisoners again in a new and creative form. Um, 
the research and development is a very early stage. Should we do an early plug for August 2021? COVID permitting. Can we do a quick plug for what's happening in August? Yes, um, we can. So we can talk about that. So as we said, we've been doing the research and development phase. And in August, um, in the summer, we are planning to have a production at Porchester Castle with uh, members from the National Youth Theatre, as well as hopefully members from the community groups that, um, that we're working with and doing workshop with. And so that's why we wanted to kind of work um, this, as I said, the history is for everyone. So shout out loud are really keen on getting people from the community involved. Um, so yeah, do come in the summer, uh, COVID yeah. safe and all permitted to come see yeah. the production and see these young people take ownership, I think, mainly of this history and bring life to the castle, which it ha probably hasn't had for a while, because I know Abigail mentioned it used to have sort of big um, sort of carnival-esque uh, productions in there before, but it'd be nice in this modern context and honouring the people who were there before. Yeah. In, yeah. Yeah, and we're just hoping that we can kind of really get, get give a sense that of of a life that would have been lived lived in that in that space, um, as well as in the Caribbean as well. Um, so really kind of just transporting us into that space and, and, and allowing it to feel like, you know, it could have been any one of us if we were born in that time, you know, um, so just kind of sharing those types of stories um, and seeing as many kind of areas in that space we possibly can. There's a bit of moving around and all that kind of jazz, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, it should be a good one. Mm, yeah, going to, going to offer, a, offer a treat. I'm going to try. We're going to see if this works. Really want to be able to juxtapose a speech by the leader of the revolution in the original play, the 1807 revolutionary philanthropist. This is Spartacus and his, his is a speech inspiring the revolutionaries. And we're then going to juxtapose that with an extract from the research and development that happened in August with the beginnings of this NYT project to, to, to reclaim the story and, and tell the story in a new way. So we're going to have sort of the, the, the old and the modern side by side in two extracts. So uh, let's see if we can hear the, the Spartacus speech. I'm not hearing anything. Aux amis de la liberté, to friends of liberty. Aux amis de la liberté, to friends of liberty. Tous les hommes naissent libres et égaux. All men are born free and equal. Tout homme qui naît dans une servitude arbitraire. Any man born into an arbitrary servitude has the right to kill those who oppress him. L'insurrection de l'esclave contre son maître. A slave's insurrection against his master is a natural right. La mort doit être Death is preferable to slavery. Vivre libre. The rallying cry mourir. of the brave should be Doit live free or die. Tous les moyens All means are legitimate to free oneself from servitude. Aux amis de la to friends of liberty. Okay. All Don't men are born liberty. free and equal. Any man born into an arbitrary servitude has the right to kill those who oppress him. A slave's insurrection against his master is a natural right. Death is preferable to slavery. Really powerful stuff. So that's that's the words of Spartacus, who's the revolutionary leader in the play from 1807, that Elaine added her little bit of subversion into by having the words repeated by a woman behind as well, so that you've got that sense that it's not just the men who are fighting for their freedom um, in the Caribbean at this time, but it's the it's the women as well. Mumba, do you want to come back in and explain to us what we're going to be listening to in a moment from the R&D? You know, so the, the very beginnings of this creative process. Mm. Yeah, so um, these words that we're going to hear are written by Lakeisha and um, they sound sort of like 
I don't know, like a haunting, but not in the so sort of scary way, but the voices that sort of ring in your, it would ring in your head of those who are missing from this history. And um, during the R&D, we explored what that journey would be like for the women on a ship coming to Porchester and we looked at the different phases of the journey looking at the beginning the middle and what it would be like to come to Porchester Castle and just see this is where you're going to be for this time in November in the cold and um, we imagine they all brought an item that was precious to them that reminded them of home and this is how we connected to the feeling of the Caribbean and where they came from and um, we also really wanted to honour the different languages and people so luckily these members are super super talented and a few of them speak multiple languages and um play instruments so you hear the violin which is played by one of the members uh Kiniso, who just played it so beautifully um and you hear the voices overlaid um in a way to reflect yeah as i said the, the voices who are missing from the story so that's yeah that's all i can give you for now Okay, shall we have the extract then? Yes. Ye jinaha. Ye nanse asase surunku pisu. Nansu. Ye waha. Ye jinaha. Here we stand. Feet on the soil of this strange land. But here we are. Here we stand. Aquí estamos de pie. Los Here pies en el stand. suelo de esta tierra Feet extraña. On the soil of this strange Pero aquí land. Estamos. But here we are. Here aquí we estamos de pie. Here we stand. Feet on the soil of this strange land. But here we are. Here we stand. And when we write the history books, they will write us out. And those like me will ask. ¿Dónde estaban todas las mujeres? And when they write the history books, ¿Dónde they will write todas us out. Las and those like me will ask, where were all the women? 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 We were we were here. We were here. I don't want to break the power of the moment. I know. Uh, that is, 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 is such a powerful piece of, of, of theatre for a group that had come together for the first time just mm. a few days before you recorded that. Yeah, and it's all online. We did that all online. It's just a bit daunting and scary because how do we feel connected in this digital space when we're so far away and, and also hold a space for each other when we are processing such a momentous part of history and for a lot of the the members that's their history, that's them, that's their direct lineage. We had members who were from um, descendants of Caribbean islands so for them that felt um, that felt quite big for them and also as you hear beautifully in the beginning um, one of the actresses is speaking in a uh, tree which is a, a language from Ghana and so that is also where the descendants started off from so it, it it feels like a lot and I find it very difficult also again to listen to that over and over again <laughs> because it's like you hear the voices and you I hope that in doing this, as a wonderful playwright says, uh, Winston Pinnock, we are honouring them and giving them the space um, when we remember them and in these times like this and give them that sort of reverence uh, for that time. So, yeah, um, yeah, it yeah. was really powerful. <laughs> Shall we shall we bring Lakeisha in yes. as, as 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 modest playwright here? Um, I don't know if you, you can see the chat, but. Um, but there's a lot of appreciation, Lakeisha, for that as an as an amazingly powerful sound piece. Um, can you just talk to us a little bit more, perhaps, about the the where things are going next? 
you know, that you've wowed us with that. I mean, this is going to be one hell of a ride we're on for. If you can do that in, in 10 seconds or 20 seconds worth of recording, what the whole play is going to be like, I, 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 don't, I can't begin to imagine. Can you, can you just, yeah, just give us a teaser and then perhaps we'll allow people to start thinking about questions that they, if they've got questions, they want to start popping them in the chat um, whilst Lakeisha tells us that, that sort of trailer for, for, mm -hmm. the, for where, where we're going next. Sure. Yeah. Firstly, I, I just want to say, you know, some of the material that has been de developed has come, you know, straight from the conversations that we've had. So I remember, you know, early on when we were all chatting via Zoom before the R&D, we were saying, like, where are all the women in these texts? And I was like, that's such a great line just to have in this play. <laughs> so thank you, Kate, Abby, <laughs> Dominique, Elaine, because I just pinched bits of bits and pieces from people. Um, but yeah, so we see. Um, so what I was keen to do is allow us to really see the space. So we we, we travel around the, the the building in interior and exterior. We're we're led by. Um, characters who are from from the Caribbean, from Africa, French, British, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, I'm keen to see the women on these on this journey. So we see the women on on the on the ships that are traveling to to be reunited with their husbands who are being held as prisoners of war. Um, we see experiences of some of those prisoners of war as well. So, you know, so we hear some monologues from those people about their the life there, the conditions that they were in and living in at that time. Um, and we also see some of the maroon communities in the Caribbean as well. So some of, um, and they're all women so far that I've written, um, women who were, you know, up in the hills in, in Jamaica or in St. Lucia or in Haiti, um, you know, kind of waiting, plotting, planning, um, to, you know, to revolt um, or hiding and escaping, all those types of things. We see those stories. Um, and just like I said earlier, just tr trying to ensure that we see a really human side of these people. Um, so hopefully, hopefully it feels it feels contemporary and hopefully it feels, I don't want it to feel like a museum piece. I don't want it to feel really kind of dry and, you know, um, unaccessible I wanted to feel um like you know like we're right there in it with them I want to see some of the the kind of you know the blood and gore. It's, it wasn't pretty revolution is not pretty it was it was unapologetic and I think that's the way I want the piece to to come across as well um and I'm really keen to play with different forms as well within within um this piece so we see movement stuff we hear lots of different types of music we see um uh, there's some monologues, there's lots of uh, duologues, so scenes with people, there's lots of different scenes as well. So it hopefully it feels quite eclectic and it feels like there's um, there's enough to kind of keep you, you, you know, your senses um, stimulated is, is what I, and that's the type of theatre that I like. I want, I want to go somewhere and feel like I'm totally, being totally absorbed into um, an experience. So that's the intention. <laughs> whether we pull that off is a different story. Uh -huh. I have every faith in you. <laughs> but you know, the members we've been working with so far have just been so amazing and so generous as well. Um, so, you know, and, and Mumba as well has been being able to lead them so fabulously into, and drawing out some great stuff from them. So I'm kind of just, a lot, I'm, it's been really great to kind of just sit back and listen to the conversations we've been having and, and watching people create so I can kind of go in, right, right, let's see if we can kind of jump off that that point or that thing that they've developed or created or conversations that we've had and um and stuff from we've, that we've had from the historians that we had come in during our initial r&d in august as well was totally invaluable yeah um, so I'll, can i give a quick shout out to them so we had tammy odamusu uh, we had a uh, kane lewin taylor and christy warren who all came in because i am a specialist of uh french theater during napoleon's time it's a bit niche um i am not by any straight of the shape or form an expert on the caribbean and the history of the revolutions in the caribbean though i'm learning fast um so we brought in some some real specialists um who actually do know about the history of the revolution and it's important that those black scholars are involved in this process um, really important for, for, for me um, being involved in the project, that it's not just me offering my reading of the revolution in Haiti, because that's that, that's not useful. It's really important that this is a genuine collaborative process that involves black scholars um, alongside me and Abigail. 
Yeah. Great. I think that I, we haven't actually got any questions come through on the chat yet. Lots of excitement about why don't we actually take all of this to St. Lucia? Um, yeah, I suspect I one or two in the team that. might be game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, perhaps if we could, yeah, we could pull pull Abigail and, and Elaine back up on the screen as well, and then um, it might encourage people to think that that, that yes, that we're we're open we're open here for, for for questions if anyone has one. I think everyone's just blown away by the extracts, both from from Elaine's sound installation and from the from the research and development phase of this. Um, that 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 those pieces of art are so powerful. Um, that, that no one has any questions at the moment. So I'm going to ask you whilst we're waiting to see if there are any questions, um, just to talk about um, what we've learned from the collaboration, because obviously this is being hosted as part of the Being Human Festival, where the idea is that academics take their research out. Um, it's something that, that, that I enjoy doing a lot because I get to work with amazing people. I would never worked with in, 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 in other ways. Um, and it brings the research into the real world. So you know, actually putting on a performance of a French prison of war melodrama in Portchester, and you realize what the acoustics are like in that space and what you can do in that space. And, and, and telling the tale of um, the, the prisoners that, that Abigail's working in, and, and being fortunate enough to, to benefit from Abigail's research, it gives us working with creatives like 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 you three gives us an opportunity to to see the research in, in a different way and it's incredibly valuable as an academic to be able to see from the other side and also you ask some superb questions yeah, that i'm not very good at you know, i'm not a very practical person that's why i'm an academic i'm an academic but 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 asking questions about stuff that i take for granted is then really useful in the research process because it pushes you into thinking about things in different ways. So for me, the collaboration is 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 amazing. Um, but what perhaps we could just tease out a little bit more what 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 having the academic knowledge behind you actually brings to the creative process. Well, it's like the heart of it, you know, without without it, we wouldn't be developing anything. Um, so it totally is the core of it. And I think it's, I think, honestly, it might sound really silly, but I'm still quite blown away that we, that there were still things of history that we are discovering now. Do you know what I mean? I feel like in this time, this age, we kind of feel like we, we've got everything, we know everything, that you know, but actually it's, 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 um, it's quite enlightening to kind of go, wow, there are people that are still trying to dig up information from the past that a lot of people have maybe deliberately trying to trying to hide or have not acknowledged or you know didn't think it was worthy of being um documented properly or whatever so and then you know people like abigail and yourself kate have, have gone actually no this is really important for us to um to share with 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 society now so that just watching your process has been really fascinating um and and it kind of it kind of reminds me when I was back at school and where my kind of love for drama came is when we had to kind of we were given a bit of extracts in history and said to go go off and do a little devised piece based on this particular scene and that's when I was like that's when I really enjoyed history because I was like great I get to play I get to I get to be it I get to pretend to live in that time and pretend to be this person so it's been a nice kind of like throwback moment for me to be like oh I can kind of you know, get my creative teeth into some um, really important and um, detailed research, um, and it's and it's it's such a privilege to kind of be like have a question and 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 for you to kind of go off and and find it, and it's like how do, how where do you get this information? From? It's really amazing, <laughs> um, and I, I really appreciate it. So it's 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 a really interesting um, learning process, and also I think this is the first time I've experienced academics and historians actively reaching out to um you know cross industries to make their research and their their work known um my experiences with with um historical contact is me having to go out of my way to go and find it so go to museums galleries historic buildings um and trying to find the things that I'm, I'm i want to find but actually it's been nice to for it to be the reverse and to know that people want to want to have this knowledge and um, information shared. Um, so yeah, it's been a lovely collaboration. I really appreciate it. I want to do more stuff like this as well, I think. Yeah. Any, you, any, you and me both, Lakeisha. 
any more stuff that you find, any more content, throw our way. We can we can try and do something with it. I tell you, some of the stuff that Abigail is unearthing about the the women, uh, I think there's more than one play in this material. Sure, sure. We do have some questions coming in. Um, so I've got. I'm going to take them in the order that they're coming in, because otherwise they might disappear um, off the off the bottom of the screen. Um, how did the National Youth uh, Theatre members respond to the depth of the historical material and research? Um, so I thought I could answer that a bit, a bit more because having spent so much time with them, I think that at first, like us, they were shocked. Um, by this history, as Lakeisha said, still unearthing that history now. We're like, haven't we found what hasn't been told to us? And um, I think at first it was quite hard for them to take because it takes a bit of looking at part of history that's quite ugly. But also we found moments of joy and resistance. There's like information about ginger beer, which we found funny. Um, we just like how the prisoners, they gave them ginger beer, like as a form of rebellion, like to, for their for their immune system, the Caribbean soldiers, they didn't like it, so they complained. And just like um, finding moments of joy in that. And um, they really actually, I think they connected to it so well that one of them is now working with Shout Out Loud, trying to really be actively engaged with the English heritage um, in, in engaging with their history. And so they really responded so well. And just because we had such great historians, Temi, oh my gosh, I could never look at art the same way again. Mm -hmm. Temi talked about, and also when you have black historians talking to you about a topic, there is a sensitivity and an understanding and a different view in which we get it. Um, Temi talks about black and sort of how black people are represented in art so you can never like literally looking at art and and products is going to be difficult and then um and also kane talks about rather than talking about slavery in a way that is quite hard for us to receive he's like look at the acts of resistance how why does someone revolt in a plantation and so you're taking this really active sense of like a very humane and very some moments of like there was power in the enslaved they found their moments of power in ways in which they revolted if it was just like i don't just all sorts of ways and um and so i think that they really hold on held on to that empowering moment of the story and they were just so like i think they were so glad to be part of this process because it's quite exciting it's, it's so exciting to be making history and also one thing about history is that especially when it comes to black history when people write stuff sometimes we're like oh is that true did it happen and that's really curious <laughs> um, and having this history and having historians like yourselves as well just finding it for us and being like yeah it happened get over it uh, it's not a far stretch <laughs> so I think that's what that's what was really good for them to see yeah and also just sharing that with each other and mm. sharing it with the historians as well was such a powerful experience like i d i don't know about um you, yourself member or elaine mm. but i've never been in a we wouldn't have been in the same room we're in a virtual room but i've never been in the same room with other black women mm. being talked to by by black historians about you know his, all everyone's history but black history as well so it was such a a beautiful experience and then to be able to create something from that so I think everyone you know we cried at the end of that week as well, yeah. we? There's loads of tears. Um, but it was, you know great he was happy to it was you know it was, it was lovely it was a lovely shared experience I think. Yeah I, I just want to add to that because it um, it was a shock it was a shock to be in that in this in that place, and I think I could feel, even though we were all on screens, and we, you know, when she, because I, I was there for Temi's talk, and she's someone that I know personally, but it's it was still a revelation what I was learning. But then to see everyone's face at the end of it, and we were all in shock. But it was also it felt as though scales had fallen from our eyes, but also we felt really empowered by it. And there was this energy, this really strong energy, so that by the time I rejoined you for the final show, showing and sharing on that Friday of that week, the actors were so strong. They had spent the entire week processing all this information and owning it. 
and then communicating what they've learned using the text that Lakeisha had written, using working with the directions. And for me, as someone working with sound, and they picked up on the things that I had fed to them earlier, it was such a marked change in how they were so confident with their voices and working with sound in a creative way. It, it felt to me it was a complete absorption of, of, of this historical information, but it's living within them. It will live with them. It was a very transformative week and life enhancing week for me, I know, and I'm sure for them and for everyone else involved. That's great. Shall we um, try and uh, uh, try and answer some of the of the other questions now? Dominique is asking how doing something like this in a heritage environment is different to doing it in conventional theatre. I don't know if you're ready to answer that question yet, but it's but but have a go. I I was going to say one plug socket is very scary for theatre. Um, <laughs> one plug socket, not a roof. There's no roof outside. Um, we don't know what British summer is going to be like. <laughs> so it's, it's but the like acoustics, hell. the acoustics are out of this world. Exactly, but it's fun because it's alive. I think that's what's really nice. It's an alive. It just feels like so lovely to the thought of working in a building. I've been lucky enough to work at Hampton Court Palace and do a play there. And there's something about being in a historical heritage building and having the history about the building being told by the actors. It's just, it just doesn't like, it, it, it kind of messes with your mind a bit because you feel like it just, yeah, it feels, it feels very magical. So that's what I'm really excited about. Yeah. And there's, I think there's something about conventional theater spaces that make the topics of the things that you're sharing feel really safe you kind of you're going into a block you know a black box room or you know over in a beautiful theater uh you know in, in the west end or wherever you you, you know consume theater and you go in and sit down and watch you know it's gonna you, you're gonna watch something it ends and you leave that space and then you kind of and you can forget about it you know often you don't but you, you can forget about it and you go back into the real world um and that just kind of creates a bit of distance from the things that you've just experienced. But actually just perform, seeing it in the space that is that has its own life um, and you sh hearing a story that is about that space allows you to kind of really immerse yourself in it, I think, in a different way. Um, you know, I think, so that's for me, that's what's quite exciting. It just kind of hopefully will we'll, uh, challenge everyone you know, everyone that goes to see it because it's it's not in a kind of we're not going to sit down in a comfy theatre with lovely plush chairs and and eat our ice lovely ginger stem ice cream. You know, we're going to be in the I love ginger stem ice cream. Notice to self, make sure we have ginger ice cream. Yeah, Jen, if Jenny's listening as site manager at Portchester, she wants to have Caribbean street food and things to give you the smells of the Caribbean to make it more authentic. But I think we do need a nod towards the ginger beer that the prisoners were given. <laughs> Is that uh, <laughs> yeah? So um, yeah, it's 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 really exciting, and um, I'm always really kind of um, looking forward to trying to push my creative boundaries as well and, and stuff like that. So it's nice, it's great, great. Um, I'm I'm I, I was say we've done a certain amount of performances in the in the space already, but largely performing in English. Um, once you put French into that space, it, it sends goosebumps down your down your spine because it's 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 an it's an well, it's not an English castle, it's a Norman castle. It's, you know, it's not really English, is it? But you know, it it feels like a very English space because we grow up with this sense that English heritage, English spaces, it's an English castle, even if it's Norman. Um, to put French into that space was really very powerful when we did Rosaliska in two thousand and seventeen. To to put black. Caribbean French heritage back into that space will be even more powerful. There's something about the juxtaposition of, of what we expect the, a castle to be and disrupting that by, mm. by, by putting the, the, the French sounds and, and, the, and, the, and the Caribbean actors back in that space, I think will be something really very special. The good news is, is that it will be streamed live to the world at some point, one way or another, either it's dress rehearsal, act rehearsal, we will be streaming whatever we, you know, the, the play in August will be streamed so that everyone can see it, even if they can't get to the castle to watch it live. I'm going to bring um, Abigail back in for a moment. Uh, we've got a question about what happened to the prisoners. What happened? Where did they get sent? Do you want to give us the sort of the, the edited history of the, the prisoners after they leave Portchester? Because they're not actually at Portchester for all that long. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, some of them are there for about a year, but I mean, some of them are still there three or four years later. So um, it takes a long time to to swap them because at, at this period, what happens is that um, enemy, if you capture enemy soldiers, then you tend to um, set up prisoner swaps um, with your enemy and um, you get back, you know, it, Britain would get back British um, captured soldiers and we'd send off a load of French ones back to France. So um, it takes a long time for some of them to get back, uh, well, to get sent to France. So basically, um, what happened is that gradually over the rest of that decade, the 1790s, the, um, the, French, the French black and mixed race prisoners um, get sent to France. They're put in, um, they're, they are consolidated into a number of colonial regiments. They're sent down to um, uh, La Rochelle, to the area around La Rochelle, um, and, and are stationed at the Ile d'Aix in a fortress there. And then they sort of get dispersed through the French um, army in, in Europe. So some of them end up um, providing services to Napoleon's brother um, in Naples, in Italy, in, in um, sort of 1809-ish. Some of them are in Corsica. Um, some of them go to Senegal. And some of them um, take part in various French expeditions back into the Caribbean. So I think that some of them may end up um, in fighting in Haiti um, in the sort of 1804, um, 1803, 1804, that sort of period. So they, they get scattered. Oh, and of course, some of them go into the British Army. So some of them get recruited into the British Army and go into regiments like um, some of the um, local militia regiments and um, the and 66th and 62nd regiment as drummers um, and fighters. Some go into the Royal Navy. So that, you know, it's a real diaspora. Um, so, and, you know, which is great, you know, it's about people's lives and where, where, the, where they go next It is just, endlessly fascinating for me you know the strategies that they devise to cope with the terrible situations that they find themselves in you know permanently adaptive and you know, get, you know doing things so I just think it's amazing so that's that's a sort of synopsis of what they did next obviously the the, the most famous what they did next Louis Delgrès okay. you haven't mentioned um oh. Now, some, some, hopefully, those in the Caribbean, but, but perhaps not everybody in Britain will know who Louis Delgrès was. But he and some of those he was at Port Chester with as prisoners end up on opposite sides. Um, do we, do, should we just send everybody to Google Louis Delgrès or do we want to give them the... the, the, oh, the, the I'll briefly give them a quick synopsis, with, which is that one of the black officers at Port Chester in the prison is called Louis Delgrès. And... Eventually, he ends up, um, he goes to France, he then goes back to the Caribbean and is engaged with fighting on Guadeloupe, on the island there. And eventually, when Napoleon reinstates slavery on the French islands, Louis Delgrès and his companions take a stand against it. And it's quite a tragic situation because one of his companions from St. Lucia, Michael Lua, Pelage, it actually takes the opposite stance. So they, they've been comrades in arms, but now they're on opposite sides of the, of, of the political sphere. And eventually, um, Louis Delgrès holds himself up at, um, at Batuba on Guadeloupe, and with the French forces surrounding him, he and his um, comrades in arms, including women, um, blow themselves up rather than be taken prisoners and enslaved again by France. Um, and it's, you know, it's a terrible, terrible story. Um, but Louis Delgrès, you know, we, is an ama amazing hero. Um, 
and is now actually um, celebrated in the Pantheon in, in Paris, where they honor French um, French heroes. So he's one that he's probably the most famous um, in the Caribbean, and I'm incredibly proud to have found his name in, at, at Porchester. Yeah, thank you, Abby. Um, we're going to start wrapping things up. I was going to say we're going to have one last question, but we've just had one question sneak in. So whilst Abby's it, you know, on, on a roll, could you say something about Forton, the hospital place at Forton? Um, again, we might have to make you wait for the PhD to be written, um, <laughs> Rowena, but if you're really lucky, Abby will give you a couple of sentences about, about Forton. And then I'm going to go to, to Anna Nealon's question about what do we think the legacy of this project is? Because that seems like a great question to finish on. Um, so it, let's, let's, Abigail can answer and tell you a little bit about Forton while the rest of us try and mull over in our mind our answer to the final question about what we think the legacy should be. Okay, so Forton Prison, um, it's um, on the outskirts of Gosport, um, on the shores of Forton Creek. I've written a blog article about it for Citizen, who are the Museum of London um, coastal archaeology um, people. So you, if you search my name and, and, and do Citizen blog, you, you, you may come up with it. it um, anyway, so it's, uh, it's another prisoner of war um, prison um, in, in, in Gosport. And the, some of the black prisoners are um, sent there um, for the additional space and the, and the medical treatment. Um, so um, that's all I'll say about it, but there's more details about it on my, as I say, on, on the blog that I've just done. If I can, I'll just have a look now, see if I can find it. We've, then... we've already beaten you to it, Abby. It's gone into the chat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the magic of technology, eh? Okay. You. Let us, let us, I mean, we can, we can, we can throw links into the chat of all sorts of things we could send you to follow. Anybody want to see early 19th century French monodrama in the castle? Shall I put the link to Rosaliska in there as well? I think I probably should. I might do that whilst you're all talking. I'll do a little bit of quick, quick plug for French melodrama so that you can, you can see uh, what, you know, theatre of the time was actually like. Um, Anna Neeland has asked us about legacy. Um, now, part of that legacy is clearly going to be educational. Um, so English Heritage and the National Youth Theatre and Abigail and, and, and I and, and probably some of the black scholars we've already worked with are going to see about putting together some educational materials. And on one hand, for those actually doing school visits to Port Chester, so there'll be a local dimension. But we're in the early stages. Abigail and I are talking to... Um, to colleagues about the Garifuna who fought and, and were held at, at prisoner uh, as prisoners at Port Chester, and whether we could do something about helping the Garifuna to understand their history. Um, clearly, there's a lot of enthusiasm in St Lucia at the moment for finding out more about these revolutionaries. So I think you know, there's, a, there's a whole scope for an educational side to providing material to help whether it's just a sound installation extract like like Elaine's, where you send the children, school children away to, to make the stories behind those names as a creative project. Um, whether you ask them to, to think about what, what, what sounds of home might be, you could do all sorts of different educational creative projects out of this. So that's obviously going to be a, a, you know, a fairly central part of, of what we do. Um, but, but that's just one one possible route that the legacy can take. Elaine, um, Mumba and Lakeisha, where do you want to see the legacy? Okay, I'm gonna jump in really quickly. Um, I think uh, the legacy, um, it's something that from a personal point of view, I think it will be carried through each and every person who's involved in the project that they continue talking about it and that's what keeps the history alive we carry history within us that's what james baldwin says it's not something that's in the past it's very present so the fact that this is this new project has come out of something that steeped in the past that i heard about it's turned into it's turning into a play and those involved in it will talk about it that is part of the legacy of it and will inspire others to do something with this history um, and hopefully change uh, the national curriculum in terms of 
of how history is taught, British history is taught, and how inclusive it is. It always has been. Okay, thank you. I don't think, you know, this, what, what could we say beyond that? I mean, that, that's the point at which I say, right, thank you all very much, good night. Um, <laughs> Because, because, Mumba and Lakeisha, Elena set the bar high there. <laughs> um, are you two going to top that in terms of legacy ideas? I'm not sure. I was just <laughs> Elaine said so much of it. I think, yeah. I think what I want for legacy, I think, is for education. Really, is like how do we engage with history? But I also want people to know that it's not just about reading it in a textbook. And it's like, how do we get up and play with history and have fun with it? Um, I also would like like some sort of podcast or something of these voices and people so we can continue those sounds where people can engage. I know if it's young people, just hearing the people speak these voices, if there's a resource for them to go in and listen and be um to to engage with because I was a teaching assistant as the many acting jobs and directing jobs you end up doing and so I've been in primary schools and I get frustrated by the lack of resources for the teachers in terms of making sure it's diverse and accurate as well um, and not just the same person so I just yeah I'd like educational resources because that's really where it needs to start yeah um, and I think in terms of uh, creatively, um, what's one thing that's come out of this strange year that we've had for theatre, we are learning how to enable our art form to um, have legacy and to and to live beyond the live experience. So we're getting a bit better at kind of doing things like live streaming things mm -hmm. and recording things and giving things a bit more of, of production value around that. So. Um, you know, naturally out of this strange year, I think we're having to think more about how we're going to record it and allow it to be accessible internationally as well. So that's great. So being able to kind of film it and have various bits of um, visual documentation and of, of the of the show itself. Um, one thing I think we already do do well in theatre is that we tend to publish play texts of new writing, you know, um, which is great. Um, I don't know if that's a possibility with this project, but you know things like that. So, but just allowing the 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 piece that we create to be accessible beyond um, what we share in August be um, a lovely idea. Yeah, and as you you may be seeing in the chat, some of you that that the the shout out loud project involving some of the National Youth Theatre actors are already out there in the community, despite the restrictions of lockdown uh, here in the UK, are, still, are out there doing community work, talking to local groups. Um, I'm very much hoping that we could do something as part of City of Culture, Coventry City of Culture next year, um, to bring the story to, to Coventry as well. This is not just about a small castle in Hampshire. This is something that is much bigger than that. This is about issues to to do with 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 race, with gender, um, with big ideas like freedom, and and that they they're they're relevant to us all. It's not just about um, about a tiny site in 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 a, in a small part of the south of England. Okie dokie, um, we to 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 conclude in a moment. There's going to be a slide going up asking you to fill in a, a, a survey the, because this is the, 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 the Being Human Festival 2020. Um, they collect feedback on all the events that are part of the festival so that they can inform and make the festival bigger and brighter and, 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 and at a time when the humanities are increasingly under threat. Despite the fact that in lockdown we all revert to reading books, watching films and longing to be able to be back in the theatre. Um, the humanities are under threat. So the more we can do to find out about how the human being human festival can be bigger and bolder and brighter and reach more people. So if you could find two minutes to fill in the survey, the links in the chat, we're going to put up a slide with a reminder of it as well. Um, that would be really great. You've got until the end of December or just before Christmas to do it, but we'd, we'd very much appreciate if you could do it on the spot now so that you don't forget. It really won't take very long just to give you um, some us some feedback and then the, the festival organisers as well. That would be amazing. Thank you very much for all the really inspiring quotes uh, that have been coming up in the chat and the enthusiasm. We're feeding off that enthusiasm as, as we talk. I'd like to thank Mumba, Lakeisha, Abigail and Elaine for joining me um, this evening to talk through 
a project that I hope you can see we are all so excited by. It is such an honor and a privilege to work with you all. You are amazing, amazing people. Um, I'm going to say a big thank you to Naomi, who's been hiding in the background, doing all of the technical bits for me. Um, so thank you very much for making that run smoothly, Naomi. Um, thank you for joining and listening to us. Um, Please feel free to get in touch if you have questions, if you want your youth group involved, if you want us to take the sound installation to St. Lucia, um, whatever it might be, get in touch um, and we will see what we can do to make it happen. Um, I'm not one for saying, oh, no, we can't do that. I'm definitely one for, right, we're doing it. You tell us your crazy ideas. We'll find a way to make it happen. So thank you all very much. Um, have a good evening. Bye. Thank you.